Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone. And we recommend you stop listening now. True crime with a dash of the paranormal, the garish, the strange, and the darkly comic. I'm Zevin Odelberg, host of Kinda Murdery, a podcast that's about more than just murder. It's my very own pocket dimension, home to a curated collection of bizarre and compelling stories, the unsolved, the unsettling, and the unbelievable. I cover it all, just so long as it's Kinda Murdery. That guy was telling you the truth. He was me. I am Zevin Odelberg, and this is Kinda Murdery. Hey, before we jump in, I just wanted to mention, as some of you may know, Sirius XM has shut down the podcast app Stitcher. So if you or anyone you know happen to listen to the show on Stitcher, please do continue to listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, CastBox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Podbean, or just about anywhere else that podcasts are offered. You can also find us on YouTube. And of course, Spreaker. We are a Spreaker Prime show, and in fact, Spreaker pays me an extra 10% for my ad revenue if you listen on Spreaker. So, gee, if you were a Stitcher listener and you're looking for a new pod player, I would appreciate it if you checked out Spreaker. All right, with that and no further ado, we're going to jump right in. Please join me right now as we uncover what truths we can and solve what mysteries we may kind of murderies don't look behind the curtain murder at the bender inn starts now in 1862 the homestead act opened a new chapter in american history at a time when the nation was deeply divided by civil war this legislation promised a fresh start for many who dared to dream. Amidst a wild landscape, burgeoning with hope and transformation, settlers headed west, among them the Bender family, who laid down roots in Labette County, Oklahoma. The land they chose was not unoccupied. The Osage Indians had once called the place home before being forcibly displaced to clear the way for new settlers. The untamed landscapes of what would become Kansas Territory began to slowly change. By October 1870, a trickle of families, each carrying their hopes and secrets, ventured into the newly available lands, choosing to establish their homes and lives around seven miles from the burgeoning city of Cherryville. One of those families, seeking a new chapter in the rugged frontier, were the Benders. They moved onto a 160-acre property facing the well-traveled Osage Trail. It was a land of promise and potential. The Benders were newcomers to the community, part of a tidal wave of humanity seeking to carve out their destiny on the American frontier. The Bender's story, like that of so many others, was set against a backdrop of national aspiration and personal endeavor. And, sadly, as I mentioned previously, forced relocation and genocide against the native peoples. With all of this happening in the background, no one could possibly suspect that the tale of the Bender family would become an unforgettable chapter in the annals of American folklore. The Bender's property had a panoramic view of the Osage Trail, which was frequented by settlers, traders, and others seeking fortunes in the West. It was a strategic location that offered both isolation and access to a flow of potential visitors, a dual promise of solitude and opportunity. This property would soon become both home and something more sinister, though at the moment it was just another parcel in a land of endless possibilities. The Patriarch and the heir, John Bender Sr. and John Bender Jr., were the vanguard of their family's journey to a new life. They arrived carrying with them the scent of foreign soil, believed to have been originated from Germany. John Bender Sr. was an imposing man, around 60 years old, his visage etched with years of hardship. English words seldom escaped his lips, and when they did, they were weighed down by a thick, guttural accent that marked him as an outsider. His son, John Bender Jr., 25 and already soaked in his father's complex legacy, was an enigma of his own. He spoke English relatively well, albeit with a noticeable accent, and had a tendency to break into inexplicable laughter. This unsettling habit led the locals, who found it difficult to decipher his character, to hastily label him a half-wit. 
In 1871, the Bender women arrived to complete the family. Elvira, or Ma as she was known, was a woman of about 55 years. Her English skills were rudimentary at best, and her demeanor was so stern and unapproachable that the locals, unable to pierce her tough exterior, named her the She-Devil. The Bender's tapestry of personalities and mysteries seemed to invite both scrutiny and speculation, yet it was precisely the kind of family one could imagine struggling and thriving in the unforgiving American frontier. It's crucial to understand that beneath the quirks and idiosyncrasies of each Bender family member lay the universal human desires for community, prosperity, and perhaps for redemption, or so it seemed. But could such a complex web of human needs and ambitions come without a price? Well, as the saying goes, every family has its secrets, and the Benders were no exception. The youngest member, Kate Bender, was the family's magnetic linchpin, a woman of 23, possessing a slender yet curvaceous figure that seemed sculpted to attract attention. Her eyes were always bright and calculating, and often accompanied by a coy, almost impish smile, hinting at secrets yet to be divulged. It wasn't just her physical allure that captivated people. Kate held a certain intellectual mystique. She professed herself a healer and a psychic, conducting seances and claiming curative powers for various ailments. Yet what set her apart and added a layer of societal titillation was her vocal advocacy for free love, not just a casual attitude toward romantic relationship, but a deep-seated belief in sexual liberation and the moral bankruptcy of traditional marital constraints. This was no small thing in the societal context of the late 19th century, and it brought an eclectic and sometimes desperate clientele to the Bender homestead. Their home was a deceptively inviting one. A canvas partition neatly divided the family's private quarters from a makeshift general store and dining area. Travelers, weary from their jury along the arduous Osage Trail, would find solace there. Or so they believed. Yet as whispers about mysterious disappearances and unexplained deaths intensified, suspicions insidiously began to gravitate toward the Bender Inn. Kate's sensually captivating presence was an intricate facade that masked the deeper complexities of the Bender homestead. What appeared to be a sanctuary amid the stark Kansas terrain would soon force the community to question the very nature of trust itself. Gradually, the seemingly idyllic appearance of Bender Inn began to crumble, revealing a much darker narrative. Initially seen as a sanctuary for weary travelers, the establishment would soon become the epicenter of an unfolding horror story that gripped the region. The nightmare began in the month of May 1871. In the remote expanse of Drum Creek, a waterway lying ominously to the southeast of the Bender Estate, a man's life was shockingly extinguished. His corpse bore the hallmarks of extraordinary brutality. A skull shattered as if struck by unbridled force, and a throat that had been so deeply and malevolently slashed, it bore the signature of sheer sadism. This wasn't an act of random violence or an unfortunate mishap. This was a calculated, vicious assault. A dreadful prologue to a series of events that would eventually send ripples of terror throughout the community. Then, in February of 1872... As winter's grip began to relent, the horror metastasized. Two additional men were discovered, their lifeless bodies bearing identical macabre traits, skulls crushed with dreadful precision, and throats slashed as if part of a grim ritual. By the time the autumn leaves began to color the Kansas landscape later that year, people traversing the once bustling Osage Trail found themselves enveloped in an aura of palpable dread. Word of these ghastly murders and mysterious vanishings seeped into the local consciousness, compelling travelers to seek alternate routes to avoid becoming the next grim headline. During this unsettling period, vigilante groups fueled by a mix of desperation and feudal courage took matters into their own hands. Their expeditions were marked by a chaotic urgency, a frantic grasping for justice in a world suddenly turned upside down. Yet despite their impassioned efforts, these amateur posses yielded little more than false arrests and the sporadic release of innocent men, failing to stem the tide of dread that had so consumed the community. The pivotal moment in this ominous tale came when George Newton Longcore, known by some simply as Longcore, mysteriously disappeared. Longcore wasn't traveling alone. Accompanying him was his 18-month-old daughter Marianne. Both were navigating the burden of recent loss. 
Longcore's wife had passed away, leaving him a widower. With his world upended, Longcore made the heart-wrenching decision to leave Independence, Kansas, for the promise of a new life in Iowa. Tragically, neither he nor his baby daughter would reach that hoped-for sanctuary. After Longcore disappeared, Dr. William Henry York triggered alarm bells. Dr. York was not just some peripheral figure in Longcore's life. York was a former neighbor and friend, and their connection was deep and meaningful. In fact, it was Dr. York who had sold Longcore the horses and the wagon for his journey, an exchange that, in hindsight, took on a poignant, tragic significance. The moment Dr. York received news that Longcore's horses and wagon were found unattended near Fort Scott, Kansas, he knew in his bones that something was deeply wrong. These were not just any horses, and this was not just any wagon. They were the very animals and cart that Longcore had acquired from him with the hopes of a new life, a new beginning. Their discovery shattered any remnants of normality, imbuing the quest for answers with an intensity that went beyond professional interest or community duty. For Dr. York, this was personal, a heartbreaking betrayal of the camaraderie, the shared conversations, and the neighborly bonds that knit a community together. Dr. York had dined with Longcore, had laughed, and mourned with him. They were men bound not just by proximity, but by the shared humanity that turns neighbors into friends. The unexplained disappearance of George Newton Longcore and his daughter Mary Ann rattled Dr. York to his core, filling him with an urgency to bring clarity to a community clouded by fear and suspicion. Thus, he became a driving force in the quest to unravel the disturbing series of events along the Osage Trail, a journey that would soon reveal the sinister depths to which humanity could sink. In the spring of 1873, with a steely resolve that was both personal and communal, Dr. York embarked on his quest to uncover the fate of George Newton and his daughter. One could sense the weight of his mission as he saddled up, eyes narrowing in on the horizon, each step of his horse carrying with it a sense of duty. Dr. York meandered through the rugged trails, engaging with local homesteaders, eyes scanning for any sign, any shred of evidence that could bring peace to a community riddled with dread that could bring peace to his own beating heart. He eventually arrived in Fort Scott, where his worst fears were confirmed. The horses and wagon, undeniably the same ones he'd sold to Longcore, were found abandoned. To add a layer of heart-wrenching certainty, he even identified clothes, garments that once covered the bodies of Longcore and his daughter as belonging to them. For Dr. York, it was a moment fraught with both revelation and sorrow, confirmation that his friend and the young child were not just missing, but had met a more horrible end. But then, on his journey back to independence, Dr. York made a fateful and ultimately tragic decision. The man who had set forth to solve a mystery would himself become enshrouded in it. He decided to stop at the Bender Inn, perhaps lured by its faux hospitality or possibly thinking he could glean some additional clues. What we know for certain is this. Dr. William Henry York walked into the Bender Inn, but he never, ever walked out. His disappearance didn't just deepen the mystery. It personally implicated his community, forever altering the narrative of the Osage Trail and sealing his own place in its grim chronicle. And unbeknownst to the Benders, they had tangled with a family not easily dismissed. Dr. York's brothers were no ordinary men. Colonel Ed York had a military background, while Alexander M. York was an influential figure in the political realm, serving as a member of the Kansas State Senate. Alarmed by the disappearance of their sibling, Colonel York wasted no time in mobilizing a search party of 75 men. The men scoured the countryside, and by March of 1873, their investigative compass pointed them directly to Bender Inn. Colonel York, armed with purpose, confronted the Benders. In a chillingly casual manner, the family denied any involvement in the vanishing of Dr. York. They deflected suspicion by suggesting that the physician might have encountered violence near Drum Creek. John Jr. even added a layer of diversion by recounting how he himself had been shot at in the same area, roughly around the time Dr. York had gone missing. Colonel York found himself in a precarious position. While his instincts told him something was amiss, the absence of tangible evidence tying the benders to his brother's disappearance forced him to make a reluctant exit from their property. As he left, he couldn't help but sense that this encounter was far from over. The atmosphere was thick with tension, the kind that precedes a storm. 
Colonel York and his search party may have left the bender in that day, but the quest for truth had only intensified. And Colonel York wasn't one to abandon a mission unfinished. As the days passed, additional damning evidence against the benders began to accumulate. Armed with new information, Colonel York returned to the Bender Inn on April 3rd, this time flanked by men carrying firearms. They meant business. The confrontation reached a boiling point when Colonel York questioned the family about a chilling account from a woman who said she had narrowly escaped the inn after Elvira brandished knives and pistols at her. Initially, Elvira feigned ignorance, pretending as if the English language was foreign to her. However, when Colonel York persisted in his allegations, Elvira's mask shattered. Suddenly bursting into fluent English, she railed against the woman's claim, accusing her of having, of all things, cursed her coffee. Losing control of her long-practice pantomime, Elvira ordered Colonel York and his men to leave her property at once. But the damage was done. Elvira had unwittingly revealed herself, demonstrating not only her fluency in English, but also a glimpse of her genuine, malicious temperament. This slip on Elvira's part only fortified Colonel York's conviction. Although the family had forcibly expelled Colonel York and his armed crew from their homestead, he left knowing that he had peeled back another layer of deceit shrouding the Bender family. The stakes had risen, and the countdown to unmasking the chilling reality had begun. In a surprising move, perhaps sensing the net closing in, Kate Bender opted for a different tactic. She offered to utilize her purported psychic abilities to help Colonel York locate his missing brother. In a tone tinged with eerie assurance, Kate invited him to come back to the end on the approaching Friday night, this time with a smaller contingent. She promised to guide him to the very spot where Dr. York was buried. This offer from Kate, who had previously magnetized so many with her mystical claims, added a perplexing twist to an already tangled web of events. It was an audacious gamble, leaving Colonel York with a complex dilemma. Should he trust Kate's disturbing offer or interpret it as another layer of manipulation. As the Friday night meeting loomed closer, the tension was palpable, thickening the atmosphere with a mix of hope and foreboding. Around the same time that Kate offered to lend her psychic abilities to the hunt, tensions were escalating in the neighboring communities. The people were afraid, and blame for the string of ominous disappearances began to be directed at Osage Township itself. To address this collective unrest and suspicion, a crucial public meeting was convened at the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse. There, in a room drenched in collective worry and suspicion, it was unanimously agreed upon. Search warrants would be secured to investigate every property lying between Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek. In an ironic twist, adding another layer of mystery to the unfolding drama, Colonel York, John Bender Sr., and John Bender Jr. were all in attendance at this very meeting. They sat among their neighbors, those who trusted and those who doubted, all while the agreement was made to delve into the very places that might uncover the Bender's own dark secrets. The tension in the room was so palpable, it very nearly twanged like a discordant violin string. A community's shared hope of finding answers was about to clash dramatically with the hidden agenda of the Bender family. A mere few days after that fateful community meeting, a local resident made a chilling discovery. The animals, all of them, on the Bender property were either dead or emaciated, a bleak sign of utter abandonment. Intrigued and concerned, Leroy Dick, an elected township officer, took it upon himself to investigate the unsettling scenario. What he encountered was enough to arouse immediate alarm. A fetid smell emanated from a trap door that had been securely nailed shut and was situated beneath a bed. Recognizing the ominous implications, Leroy Dick wasted no time in calling for a search party. The response was overwhelming. Hundreds of local residents, fueled by a combination of curiosity, concern, and perhaps a sense of impending justice, converged on the Bender property. They came armed not just with their collective will, but with the physical tools to unearth whatever dreadful secrets lay hidden, shovels and pickaxes gripped firmly in hand. The atmosphere was thick with apprehension as the crowd prepared to delve into the very bowels of the Bender Inn. The search party braced themselves as they pried open the sealed trap door, but nothing could have possibly prepared them for the grim tableau that lay beneath. 
And if you'd like to know what the search party found beneath the hidden under the bed nailed shut trap door in the Bender Inn, then please join me this Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time for the thrilling conclusion of Don't Look Behind the Curtain, Murder at the Bender Inn. Until then, I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery. Oh, my God.